Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the latest webinar by MBF Bioscience. It's the first day of autumn, the most colorful season in New England, when all the trees put on a dazzling display of fall foliage. This short time is one of the many reasons to love Vermont, which is where MBF is located. And this year, the colors are going to be spectacular. But I digress. If you don't know me already, I'm Sue Tappan, staff scientist here at MBF. I run the day-to-day -day operations at our contract research facility, MBF Labs. I'm also the product manager for Neuralusta 360, our immersive software for automatic neuron reconstruction. Today, I'll be introducing you to it. It's our newest image analysis program for yielding accurate, informative reconstructions of neurons. You're likely familiar with Neuralusta, our flagship product. It was introduced in 1989, and it revolutionized the field of neuroanatomy by digitally representing the structure of neurons in 3D. From its inception, MBF Bioscience has been a pioneer in developing and improving microscope and computer-based scientific research systems. Neuralucida has continually evolved as a powerful system that has been cited in over 5,000 research papers. Neuralucida was originally developed for tracing at the microscope first by looking through the oculars, and then by looking at a monitor with a live digital camera image. Thus, the way the image data is presented within the program is consistent with this view from the microscope. You create trace data by navigating up and down through the image, one focal plane at a time. To view the model in 3D, you launched a 3D visualization window, which allowed you to look at, but not touch, the data. With Neuralusta 360, we've released you from that microscope-centric point of view. From image stacks, you can automatically reconstruct neurons in a three-dimensional environment to obtain reliable data about the size, shape, and complexity of neurons. You're able to interact with the 3D image to dynamically change your view while simultaneously tracing or editing your reconstruction. This is really intuitive. Neuralucida 360 works with 3D and 2D images acquired with confocal, two-photon, light sheet, and epifluorescent microscopes or slide scanners. It also operates on image data acquired with a bright field microscope. It is, a, it is designed from the ground up to excel at handling very large images, such as whole slide images or images of tissue cleared with clarity, scale, iDisco, any of those um, methodologies. On the left, you'll see an experienced scientist creating a reconstruction using Neuralucida. On the right, the same person is reconstructing the same neuron in Neuralucida 360's 3D environment. To reconstruct, it's often as simple as find the soma, click it to reconstruct the soma volume. Locate a dendrite or axon and move your cursor along it. The algorithm will find the thickness of the process as it traverses the image volume. Edits can easily be made in the 3D environment. Simply put, Neuralusta 360 allows you to collect more data in less time. So what can Neuralusta 360 do? It provides tools for automated, interactive, and manual reconstructing and modeling of trees, soma, spines, and synapses. Today, I'm going to demonstrate each of these functions, and we've got a lot to get to if I'm going to show you any of these in any depth. So let's get to it. First, let me describe the system that I'm using. I'm using a Windows 7 64-bit 3.2 gigahertz PC with 24 gigs of RAM and a 4 gig AMD Radeon R9 380 series graphics card. It's a bit of a mouthful, but what I'm trying to um, provide you with is an idea of the computer that I'm using. It is not a, a massively powerful machine, but it's not the clunker from 1985 either. Depending on the size and complexity of the image data that you're going to be working with, you may want to have more system memory. Basically, the more RAM you have, the better. Neuralusta 360 is a graphics-intensive program, so the performance of the software is impacted by the system that is running it. You can contact us to help you determine if your PC will be suited for running Neuralusta 360. We're happy to help. Okay, so let's get right to it. I'm going to switch to Neuralusta 360 and we'll start reconstructing our first image stack. So I already have it launched. So Neuralusta 360 is typified by this, this immersive 3D window that I'm um, moving around here. It is within uh, Neuralusta itself. So you have the 
powerful program, Neuralucida, behind you to add even more context and uh, data to your reconstructions. Neuralucida 360 allows you to have that 3D immersive environment for, for working within. So I'm going to load an image set to get started with. And very importantly, you want to make sure that the image scaling is correct um, when you load the image data. If you want any, any metrics out of your reconstruction and you want those to have any meaning, of course they need to be representative. So we're going to load the file, and you can see that it's 512 image planes through this volume. This is actually a subset of a cleared specimen with a scale. And so here are the, the cortical neurons um, from, from that region. So it's a single field of view. In Neuralucida 360, you can see that you can automatically start interacting with and navigating through your image volume really quickly. So all I'm doing right now is using the mouse and the left mouse button to grab and drag the image volume to, to move it around. To zoom in and out of the image volume, I'm just using the scroll wheel. And finally, you can pan from side to side by holding down the shift key. Up along the top, I'll go through these um, settings really quickly. The first one is the reset or home button. And so if you'd like to view the image data from the perspective as it was captured on the microscope, you can just select it. The next three, or sorry, four icons are, are typical. You should recognize each of these. It's everything from new tracing to open an image file. The next four represent the views that you're able to um, spe specify in Neuralucida 360. So the 3D volume view, and then three projection views, XY, XZ, and YZ projections. This next icon here allows you to see all three together. And so you can zoom in and pan and shift any of these projection views. The next two are how to navigate within the image volume itself. The first one is a simple rotation. And the, um, the one to the right is a pivot point. I'm going to be using this a lot, a lot when I start um, doing some reconstruction, so I'm just going to skip over that for the moment. The remaining ones, uh, the camera is a snapshot. Hide and show tracing. This is handy to confirm that the reconstruction that is being done automatically for you is something that you agree with. It also allows you to just see the image data um, that, that uh, you've loaded rapidly without being obscured by the trace data. Uh, location and then um, your help icon. So let's let's create some data. So I'm gonna get a nice off angle view of of our volume here. And I'm gonna reconstruct SOMA. So over here on the right, this panel here represents sort of the data creation side of things. So up along the top is sort of views and housekeeping, if you will, like creating and saving data. But on this side, we're going to actually have the tools present to allow us to um, make structures. So first, let's create some SOMAs. So I'm using the scroll wheel to size my cursor. If you can see, um, there are axes, boundaries that change shape as I uh, move the scroll wheel up and down. And that is just giving us, giving the algorithms in a bounding box uh, to search for the somas. And as I select somas to reconstruct, you can see that they're being created in any of the views and being translated to all the other views. And so you can, this is actually kind of addicting. You can, you can do this sort of all day long. Um, and so if you want, sometimes I use this, um, these projection views to, to keep an overall global view of what's going on. It's kind of similar to the macro view, except you can also create data inside it. It's pretty cool. So, so this is um, how you would create individual SOMAs. So this is what we call click to detect. You can detect all SOMAs, but that's going to take a little bit of time, and I want to get right to tracing this spaghetti of all these apical dendrites from these cortical neurons. So I'm going to move over to that. So let's take a step to the right 
and we're going to take a look at the um, tree reconstruction. We have three methods for tracing trees, manual tracing, interactive tracing, and fully automatic. I'm going to start with um, interactive tracing. So to interactively trace, I'm also going to pan to window center and get out of um, quad view so that I can have a nice big view for you guys to see what's going on. So um, I've selected interactive and uh, I have multiple options for ways to trace. The important thing to know is not what method you're using, but just that you have options. So you've got three different ways to adequately and accurately reconstruct your, your image data. And the different algorithms will perform diff differently depending on the complexity of the scene. So what's going on in the image itself. And so once we get started, you can see that um, I get these bubbles, which show me the path that the neuron or that the algorithm is finding for this particular segment. And I'm going to confirm it and come down and trace as we go through all of these different segments. And so you can rotate the segments here and change your view as you trace. Okay, we can switch. So you saw that Raber's crawl had that issue when the um, image data got a little sparse and spotty. Directional kernels is actually a pretty good um, algorithm to switch to in that situation. So let's continue with Vox or um, Raber's crawl and just see if we can un uncover another situation for another dendrite where it makes sense to switch algorithms. If not, that's okay. But just know that that's a possibility. Okay, so I'm focused on my tracing here. And you can see that you can make your changes and your tracings at whatever perspective is helpful to you to see what's going on. Okay, oh, here's an example of switching to directional kernels. And so here we can have it jump over that that particular um, spotty staining um, and then switch back if we wanted to. And so you can do all of that um, nice and quickly and easily in this immersive environment. Um, Lorenzo has a question and he wants to know, does the acquisition need to be done with Neuralusta or can it be performed, um, for example, with Zeiss? The answer is yes, you can, uh, to both actually, you can uh, acquire your image using a, a microscope controlled by Neuralucida, or you can bring in image data uh, from another microscope. So the input into Neuralucida 360 is image data. We read um, LSM, LIF, so LIF files, IDS from Nikon, OIB from Olympus, as well as generic TIFFs and JPEG 2000 file formats. In this particular case, this was a confocal image um, that was a TIFF series, but I converted it to a JPEG 2000 file format, so it became a JPX file to make it um, to take advantage of the compression uh, qualities that JPX offers. That allows things to um, trace quickly and easier um, because of the file format itself. We can get into that in greater detail if you'd like. Uh, let me answer one more question, and then we'll um, then we can move on. Um, so the question is, does it have to be three D images? And the answer is no. Um, the very first iteration of the software was restricted to three D, um, but the software that is to be released imminently, which this is a demonstration version of that software, is um, uh, uh, can work on two-dimensional images too. So if you've got cells and culture or um, or a slide scanner or something like that, absolutely you can bring those images into Neuralista 360 for reconstruction. If you're working with any of the novel tissue clearing techniques, you have the capacity to generate image volumes that are really, really large in the realm of big data from tens of gigabytes to hundreds of gigabytes. 
So we're putting the finishing touches on a tool, it's called subvolume, which will allow you to restrict the view and analysis to a small portion of the image volume. So your image volume that you're working with doesn't have to actually be very large in terms of gigabytes to be difficult for you to reconstruct. Um, either automatically, manually, or interactively. It could be just really, really dense. And so having the subvolume tool, which will allow you to restrict the area in which you're working um, to only that small region, is an area or a tool that we're very excited about. But it is too big a topic, quite literally, to discuss today. I'm going to devote an entire webinar to this next time. If you are coming to SFN, come to our booth and I'll show it to you. Um, so in this case, what we would, um, the subvolume tool will allow you to do is um, have only a small subset, um, the, the volume of which is determined by you. So you would size the, the cube to represent how big of an area you want to work with. And then you would be able to, to reconstruct only within this region, either automatically or interactively. And you can see here that in this cerebellum image, this was um, provided by uh, Stan Watson's group, Brian Martin, and colleagues. So thank you very much for allowing me to demonstrate, uh, use this data. You can see that these fibers and processes are really, really dense. And so you don't want to have everything present at the time that you're doing the reconstruction. Let's go back to Neuralusta 360. This time I'm going to show you fully automatic tracing. So I'm going to bring Neuralusta 360. Okay, now I'm going to load another stack. So back to the topic. So I've loaded this particular neuron. This is a, a, a neuron that was imaged as a single field of view. And so you can see that it's got um, some of the areas of the dendrites, the basal lateral and the apical dendrites, are cropped by the field of view. But if we want to reconstruct it, we'll start with our soma. And so um, previously, I showed you the interactive tracing tools. This time, I want to show you fully automatic. And so when you select fully automatic, you have two methods. So previously with interactive, we had three methods. Right now, we have two in, um, integrated for fully automatic tracing. So I'm going to select voxel scooping. And your strategy for reconstruction may be um, Maybe different than how I like to approach things, but I always like to hit the button, see what I get, and then make adjustments as necessary. So that's, I always like to hit the shiny buttons first. So I'm going to hit the blue button called Trace and let the software do the reconstruction. You can see that it reconstructed nice and quickly, um, but it didn't get everything exactly right with these um, default settings. So there's two strategies that you can employ. One, you can go in and make adjustments to the settings. Or, in this case, because the um, reconstruction is really quite good, except for a few places that might need a little cleanup, this gives me a great opportunity to demonstrate some of our editing tools. So let me uh, show you that. So to edit, if you've used Neuralusta in the past, um, you know that editing in 2D, when you have a complex structure, can be um, a bit complex, to say the least. Um, one of the best things I think about Neuralusta 360 is the ability to edit your reconstruction quickly and easily. And so in this case, you can see that this segment didn't get traced and connected properly as a tree structure. So I'm going to zoom in. So I'm in edit mode, and I clicked the connect button right here. And so now what I'm going to do, well, actually, let me, whoops. Oh, let me show you pivot point. So pivot point allows you to specify the center of rotation. This is wonderful when you're trying to get a closer look at a very specific spot. And so now I'm going to connect my two segments together so that this tree is correct. It's as simple as that. There's no right clicks. There's no complicated changes that have to be done. It's just easy peasy. And now let's take a look at this branch. For some reason, my default settings mistracing this branch entirely. So let's just switch back to trace mode 
and interactively trace it. So we can do it in voxel scooping just to keep everything consistent. Or if you wanted, you could switch even while you're tracing to Raber's crawl or directional kernels. You can see that as I'm tracing, instead of this right click option to um, splice and connect and all of this, when you're tracing, um, if you mouse over where an existing tree already is, you can see that I get this connection point that appears. In this case, it's blue because of the tree that's yellow. And I just, um, I can rotate about to figure out exactly where that connection point should be. And I select it and it automatically connects that tree or that branch to that tree. Okay, so we can do the same for this guy here. And finish things up. Okay. Okay, so um, the point of morphometric analyses is to create a reconstruction of your neuron um, with a desired degree of accuracy. And so you can come through and, and make any other changes that are necessary until it looks exactly the way that you want. You can adjust the thickness of individual points to have it match. You can turn on and off the tracing so that you can see the, how accurately the reconstruction actually is. And this is really pretty fabulous. And then finally, you can also even adjust the, the trees themselves so that you can uh, see the trace data and the image data simultaneously. You can do it while you can see the full structure of the tracing showing the thickness, or you can even switch to wireframe so that you can just quickly and easily see what's where. So this is similar to display thickness in Neuralista. I'm going to show you now the analyses that can be done in Neuralista Explorer. So Neuralista Explorer is our software program that is, or that's where all, all of our metrics are done, all of our analyses. And so you'll load your reconstruction. So this sort of cooking show, I've already got it done. And here's our reconstruction. You can do shoal analysis. And you can specify the radius, um, and you can see that the shoal analysis is quickly and easily done. In addition, you can do any number of branch structure analyses. Um, Neuralusta Explorer has been around um, since Neuralusta was created, and so through feedback from researchers like yourselves, uh, we have added analyses as you've requested them. So as you're encountering uh, your particular research question, you need a way to describe how this neuron is different from that neuron. Um, our analyses have grown through through the years, and it will continue to grow. So as you determine new information that is important to you, we're happy to add those analyses to Neuralista Explorer and make your research faster and better. So there's a question about uh, resolution and magnification, so what you should use. I'd like to just take a, a sidestep to talk about your image input to the software for, uh, for reconstruction. That question was covered in our previous webinar, so if you want more detail, just go back to that webinar because that webinar um, I did uh, with Dara Dickstein from the ICANN School of Medicine, and she did a really great job of describing how to fill cells for reconstruction and, and how to um, consider the application for reconstruction when you're doing your imaging. But in short, your resolution that you need for an adequate reconstruction depends on the complexity of the structures that you're looking to reconstruct and how big they are, right? So how many of them are they and how close they are together in Z, for example. So if you're doing a simple neuron reconstruction, uh, you can tolerate uh, a lower resolution acquisition. So say 40x magnification with a step size of about one micron. If your dendrites in, are very close together, or you're also interested, say, in spines or synapses, you're going to want to image at a higher magnification with a smaller step size. So increase that resolution so that you can really tell where 
these processes are going and where the spines actually are, for example. And so in that case, if you're looking at spines or synapses, I would recommend 100x for your imaging and a very small step size of 0.5 or smaller for sure. There's a, a question asking if the interactive method, the semi-automated, are those bubbles connecting to themselves or do you have to guide them? It's a little bit of both. So um, you provide the path, so you provide the direction and the algorithm will walk along the dendrite showing you where the algorithm is identifying the dendritic structure for tracing. You can modify that based on your um, mouse position and you can um, click to place points to set your position as you go. Before I go on, I just want to make sure everybody understands the difference between Neuralusta 360 and Neuralusta Explorer. So Neuralusta 360 is where you create the data, and Neuralusta Explorer is where you understand um, the reconstruction, so the metrics and the math behind the reconstruction that you've created. So all the math and all of the analyses are done in Neuralusta Explorer. It is a companion program to Neuralusta and Neuralusta 360, so it is a part of your package, but we just do all the math in a separate program. Arcana, would really like to see if you can reconstruct an axon during the webinar. So my last um, image actually has, has an axon in it, so I'll make sure that that's what I reconstruct. There are so many questions. It's really pretty fabulous. So keep um, sending them in. I really appreciate it. And I'll try to uh, answer them as I go along. One last related question is about the resolution issue is, well, if you're acquiring images at 100x, is it possible to stitch images with Neuralucida or do you need something else to do that? The answer is you can stitch those images together using our image montage module. So you can actually utilize our stitching methodology from image stacks that you yourself capture uh, independently using the image montage module. Conversely, you could create what we call a virtual tissue, an image montage that's created by the software that where the software directs where the microscope actually moves to to collect those images. You can then create that as a montage automatically with no seams or anything, and then you can bring that into Neuralista 360. If you create montages from another software program, uh, we can read those too. So you bring us your image data, we will analyze it for you. Okay, on that note, we've got to get back to the demo. So I'm going to bring up Neuralusta 360, and now we're going to do spines. So let me load again the scaling. So this is a spine image. It was imaged at 100x um, with a little bit of a zoom on the confocal, so the lateral resolution of the image is 0.05 xy, and the z-step is very tiny, as you can see, at 0.1. This image was then deconvolved before it was brought into the software for analysis. So you can see that it's really nice, crisp, and clean. Okay, So we want to reconstruct those dendritic spines. We want to model those spines. And so to do that, we're going to model the dendrite first. And in this case, you know, previously I told you that um, I like to click the trace button, um, see what it gives me, and then, and then make adjustments as necessary. But I'm going to walk you through some of these settings first. So we're going to display the seeds. So these seeds are starting points for the algorithms to, to know what to trace and what not to trace. Okay. We can refine the seeds, and then we can even remove seeds that are over areas that we don't care about. Okay. You can also add seeds in if you'd like. So you can come in here and add a big seed there to represent that um, thickness of the dendrite if you'd like. And then here's the kicker. So in this case, we've got seeds being found on all of our dendritic spines, which makes sense. The seeds are just starting points for the algorithm, but I'm only interested in tracing the dendrite. So I'm going to utilize this feature right here. So you're going to remove any traces that are smaller than a set value. So I'm going to set that to something bigger than my biggest spine. So in this case, I'm going to set it to 10 microns. Okay. And I'm going to hit trace. And we've got our dendrite modeled. Okay. Now let's switch to spines. So we went from the, the 
um, tree reconstruction to the spine um, modeling um, option. So just like in the other areas, we've got different settings. The outer range is um, how big is your biggest spine. So how far out from the surface of the dendrite do you want to look? The minimum height is your smallest spine. So anything less than 0.3 microns from the surface of the dendrite is not going to be considered a spine. It will be ignored. The detector sensitivity, again, is looking for that um, what's foreground and what's background. So what's a spine and what's not. And minimum count is how big. Okay. So here we've reconstructed and modeled um, the dendritic spines nice and quickly but it picked up some of these spines here on this, um, this adjacent branch that I'm not interested in analyzing. There's two ways you can deal with that. One, you can just delete these spines and carry on with your day, or we can make an adjustment to this outer range. So I'm gonna set it to two. I'm gonna clear all these spines and detect it again. And look at that. So there's two features here, two ways for you to um, modify your data. You can go through and edit and just clean up things if you like, or you can go through and make changes to the settings. It all depends on what seems to be the best solution for you at the moment. Right now, the spines are colored to indicate that they're individual objects. Um, and so this allows us to make um, some determinations, for example, here to say, oh, you know what, this guy is really one big dendritic spine. Let's go into edit mode. I'm going to select these two and I'm going to merge them. Okay, you can also split um, objects that are spines that are two together, for example, and you can walk through it and do that as necessary. You can, of course, select them and delete them. You can change their transparency. There's a bunch of things that you can do, but a lot of people are very interested in the classification. Not everybody are, um, is interested in classifying the spines, though. They're, they may just be interested in detecting, and so we've separated the two steps. Uh, detect to find them, and then this button here to classify them. We are classifying spines based on the 2008 paper from Rodriguez, Rodriguez et al. Um, and so this software, Neuralusta 360, our spine detection software, is um, uh, utilizing that classification criteria for the spines that are detected. Importantly, um, Neuralusta 360 was created with support from the NIMH. We had what was what's called a lab to marketplace um, grant, and what we've done is implemented and worked together with the developers and creators of Neuron Studio to take the best of their software, the best of our software, and make it the best for you. And that's um, that collaboration is what you can see present here in Neuralusta 360. So you can see here as I rotate around um, that the classification has been done. Red is thin, um, blue is mushroom, and green is uh, Philopodia. No, Stubby, I believe. Let me confirm. Let me select this guy. Oh, Stubby. Yep. So green is Stubby. Red is Thin. Blue is Mushroom. And you can make changes to that. So you can say, you know what? I really don't think that's a thin spine. I'm going to mark it as other. And I'm going to make it, you know, peach or putty. <laughs> and so we can save our data file and you can do this iteratively if you'd like. So we're going to save our spines file. And bring back up Neuralista Explorer so I can show you the uh, analyses that are present. Okay. Okay, so Neuralusta Explorer. I'm going to bring up our spines um, data file. So here's our reconstructed dendrite and all of the identified spines. 
And now we can look at the branch structure analysis. And now I want to focus on the dendritic spines. So we switch to the spines tab and select spine, dendritic spines and spine details. And you can see that the data that comes up is pretty um, extensive. So let me just walk you through it just a little bit. First, we start off by telling you what branch it was on. So what tree and then what branch. In this case, we're only looking at a small segment, so there really is no branch order. Um, if you had a very involved um, neuron montage imaged at 100x where you had all of the ability to, to know what spine was and what distance it was from the soma, we would keep track of that for you. Um, the spine type is listed next, and so you can see here's that, that spine that I labeled as other, and you can see that I made that choice, and so it's listed as a manual under assigned type. All the other ones are automatically determined based on the classification settings that were present in the software adapted from that Alfredo uh, Rodriguez et al. 2008 paper. Uh, we have a link to that on in our help too, so if you want access to that paper and see how it's um, coming up with their classification scheme, you can get to it right from the help inside the software. You can just see that there is just a wealth of information available here inside Neuralista Explorer dealing with each of these spines. And so if you want to come up with your own classification scheme, you can. Um, and and that's something that you can do at will. So you can you can model these as you'd like. Okay. Okay. Before I go to synapses, I'm going to take a little bit of time and answer some questions. I hope uh, I'm hope I'm showing you some some good uh, reconstructions of things that you're interested in. Um, and I can see that you know there's there's lots of people who are interested in lots of different things. So, as I said, I hope I can touch on something that that captures everybody's attention. So Bruce has a question. Uh, it was more of a comment. He says that you know spines should be connected, um, the mushrooms and filopodia and so on. And so your spines are not co connected? Question mark. Question mark. Um, you're right. Dendrites have spines and they don't orbit the dendrite. They're actually attached via, you know, the spine neck. But the spine neck is often very, very thin and very small. And depending on how you're labeling your your neuron in order to visualize those spines, you may not be getting your visualization method, so your label, for example, into that adequately into that spine neck. Or you may not be able to image that spine neck um, adequately. Maybe it's it's um, actually coming down from the dendrite. Um, and so depending on your step size, you're just missing it. The statement is, yes, spines are connected. And so we associate those spines as a part of that dendrite. But what we're going to do for you is model the shortest path distance from from the spine head to the surface of the dendrite or to the center of the dendrite um, as as you would like. Uh, we give both values and you can you can provide the metric that matters to you. But um, your your ability to see the spine neck may vary. What are the typical criteria for defining a spine head? This is um, asked by Alice. We are relying on the paper that was provided by um, or published by uh, Rodriguez et al. And that comes out of the Mount Sinai School of Medicine, the ICANN School of Medicine, um, in 2008 for those um, classification schemes. So how to how to figure out how big the spine is and and how to classify it according to a um, a spine type for modeling the spine. Those different characteristics of the spine. Again, we're going to use those parameters that you set up during the detection. So distance from the surface of the dendrite as well as clearance from the dendrite in order to help determine what pixel data in your image is actually a spine. Uh, Salwa asks, just to confirm, for clean synapse images, you recommend imaging at 100x magnification and 0.5 step for Z 
for the Z step or less. Yeah, I, I think, you know, you're actually that's a good segue. So let's let's look at some uh, synapse images. So let's do some synapse detection. So I'm going to load an image. And here you can see that the step size is one and a half microns. Uh, I would recommend going smaller. Um, and you can see that the lateral resolution is half a micron or a quarter micron, excuse me. So we're going to load um, the image stack. And so here we're interested in not the C of green, which in this case is um, V glute one. This is um, courtesy of Francisco Alvarez at Emory University. So thank you very much for letting us use this image for demonstration purposes. And so you can see that there is a labeled um, dendrite and um, staining for V glute one. And we're not interested in all the V glute one puncta, but rather the ones that are in close apposition to the dendrite itself. And so that's the question that, that uh, we're looking to address with the synapse detection. So not all of these objects, but only the ones that are close enough to the dendrite to be associated functionally, potentially, with the dendrite. And so you can see that it's really nice to have this 3D ability to um, rotate the image so that you can get a close look at your data. Okay, so I'm going to reset that and I'm going to reconstruct my uh, dendrite. I'm going to do it automatically. And I'm going to switch to synapses. So I'm going to come back here and turn back on my green channel. So my VGLU one. Okay, so here's our reconstruction. And before I go too much further, I'm just going to change the color of this branch. Make it aqua. Hopefully that's easy to see. Yeah. Okay, so back to synapses. So now we're going to um, do a detection of these putative synapses that are a, a specified distance from the surface of these reconstructed dendrites. And um, you could come in here and um, determine what the appropriate specification is. So sensitivity, again, is foreground and background. Surface clearance is, does the puncta need to be on the trace dendrite or not? If you turn this off, then yes, it will have a requirement that it touch the trace dendrite. If you want to allow a boundary to say allow for dendritic spines, for example, you just increase that value um, and the outer range limit to encompass um, the boundary beyond the dendrite which the detection is going to occur within. So you can imagine sort of a bracelet sliding along the, the dendritic branch itself and within that distance is where the um, algorithm is going to look for the puncta. The last thing you need to do is set the channels. So the synapses, VGLUT1 uh, marker is in green and the neuron is in red. So now that we've got everything set, we're just going to select detect all. And the software will run through and detect. And you can see here in yellow, there's individual putative synapses that have been determined on the basis of these sensitivity settings. So the sensitivity, surface clearance, and outer range. You can go through and define which synapses to keep. So you can um, filter these synapses on the basis of their different parameters here. But before we do that, let's take a closer look to see what was marked and why. So we're going to go back to image. And now we're going to show image slice mode. So here we have the ability to have multiple cut planes. And I'm going to get it so that we can see an individual puncta here. How about these guys? Let's go confirm the presence of 
synaptic marker on our object of interest. And so here VGLUT1 is in uh, modeled in yellow and you can see here that the green and yellow colocalization here represents that um, uh, apposition of the VGLUT1 right with our dendrite. And so and then if we were to just shift this just a little bit more and, and adjust this guy, I think. There we go. And we can see the um, glutamatergic uh, vesicular glutamate um, objects being modeled right here. And so if we zoom out a little bit more, you can see that we can come through here and just walk along our dendrite looking for the points at which the markers there come right up against our dendritic marker. So again, the synapse detection that we're doing in Neurolucida 360 is identifying not all of the uh, vesicular glutamate that's present in the image, rather we're filtering it to only those that are in close opposition to our labeled and reconstructed dendrite. And so that's the type of analysis that we're able to do with um, um, Neurolusta 360. So if you did want to go through and step-by-step step determine of all of these individual um, puncta that were identified, whether or not um, certain classifications you wanted to uh, employ, so restrict to a certain distance from the dendrite, for example, or walk through and say that it really needed to co-localize specifically with the dendrite itself, so have no surface clearance, then you can make those changes and it will update as well. And so similar to um, spine detection, analyses. Um, synapses also have a wide variety of analyses that are present um, in Neurolusta Explorer as well. So let's go back to this. So again, just to come back, we're not interested in this whole sea of vesicular glutamate. We're really only interested in the ones that are right on top of our dendrites. Um, I have one other demonstration image stack that I'd like to show you that gets to this idea of how do you deal with bigger image data. So uh, one single field of view isn't necessarily big enough to, to get the whole perspective of the neuron that you're interested in at the resolution you want in order to collect your data. And so you want to create an image montage. So this data is provided by um, Rebecca Piskorowski and I'm I'd like to thank her for allowing us to use this data. And so in this case, these were individual images that were um, captured by hand. So she determined where to move the stage in order to capture the apical dendrites of this particular neuron and then um, the soma and the basolateral dendrites in order to get the entire neuronal structure within um, the image data. She brought it into Neuralista 360 and then um, used our image montage module to montage it. And previously somebody asked about reconstructing an axon and so that fits very nicely with this. So this is the axon for this particular cell and so we can, we can reconstruct that. I'll show you that. But there's a couple of things I want to be able to demonstrate to you. One is that big data, big image data, is something that is important to you, which means it's important to us. So we want to be able to reconstruct across many fields of view, whether or not it's um, across a montage or within, say, a large clarity volume. And um, the software needs to be agile in order to permit that. So we'll go in here. And you can see here that this is really complex. There's a lot going on here. And so you can decide how best to reconstruct this. You can do little bits at a time. Or you can end the tree and zoom out a little bit to where it's a little bit easier to see what's going on. And work your way back. 
And in a lot of cases, that's, that's the direction I like to go is because I like to warm up to working all the way to, to this big complex scene. And so if I make a mistake, it's as simple as um, detaching and, and tracing the segment as it is likely to go. Um, and you would work on your reconstruction either automatically or interactively. You can also switch to manual mode so that you can um, uh, make, make the tracing be exactly the way that you want it to. Um, and you can trace across these image volumes. So that's one thing that I really want to show here. So we can trace these fine volumes here in these image boundaries. So at the so I can go into image slice mode if I'd like and look at this boundary and really get a good feel for what's going on here. So here you can see right where that axon connects and branches. And so if I come back to tree, I can continue tracing. Okay. So I can either manually move the, the trace as I um, walk through, or I could um, set it up so that it automatically targets. Um, so you have that ability to switch back and forth between your um, image display to give you the clarity you need in order to make the reconstruction as accurate as you want. So to show you that, I, I haven't gotten to the point of showing you an individual neuron fully reconstructed. And so let me show you what that one looks like when we have enough time to actually do it. So here's our neuron. and the image volume. So we can turn on and off the image volume. And you can see how the reconstruction accurately models um, the, the varicosities that are present in the axon, as well as um, the complex branching that is present in the basolateral dendrites. And one thing that we're implementing for Neuralusta 360 is this ability to create a really crisp and clean model that you can use for your presentations, whether it's your poster for your SFN abstract, your thesis defense, or that publication to nature that you really want to have um, nice, crisp, and clean, and gorgeous. And this is something that um, we're implementing now, a high-quality model that just demonstrates the reconstruction as a whole rather than the sum of its parts. So now we can let me provide a quick summary of, of what I've talked about today. So Neuralista 360 provides inter, um, intuitive and comprehensive tools for analyzing image data to extract neuronal morphology. These data analyses are provided by Neuralista Explorer. Um, and as a reminder, a powerful computer containing a modern graphics card is recommended. If you are coming to the Society for Neuroscience um, annual meeting, please come see us. It's, we're right on the main aisle. And uh, it is just, we're at the corner of the posters and the main, main aisle. So you just walk past the SFN booth, come all the way down to the posters, and you can stop in and see us. If you'd like to get a demonstration of any of our software products, including Neuralusta 360, you can stop by the booth and, and just sit right down and get a demo. Or if you've got a really packed schedule, which I know is so easily to do with those fabulous um, management software for figuring out which of the 10,000 posters you're going to go see. Make arrangements now to schedule a demo or to meet with one of us individually. You can reserve your time by going to this website here, mbfbioscience.com slash sfn dash demonstrations. This just gives you a way to put us in your calendar if you so choose. One other thing to add to your calendar for the Society for Neuroscience meeting is that we're giving a symposia. Um, we're presenting two research posters and hosting a symposia on Sunday evening. So the NIH has identified the need to enhance the reproducibility of biomedical research. This symposia is 
um, designed to provide an overview on how unbiased stereologic methods enhance the reproduci re reproducibility of quantitative results to propel bench to bedside therapeutic development. I hope you'll join us for this discussion of quantitative microscopy and refreshments will be served. If you'd like a free trial of Neuralucida 360 or any of our other products, you can contact us um, by sending us an email, giving us a call, coming to see us at the Society for Neuroscience meeting, or going right to this website right here and inputting your information. We're happy to get you hooked up. We'd like to see um, you using our software. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, I really appreciate your, um, your attendance, and I look forward to seeing you at the Society for Neuroscience or, or um, via email. Um, I'll stick around for just a couple of minutes more to see, um, see if I can go through some of these questions because there were so many and they were so fabulous that I'd like to address a couple. Um, but uh, thanks again for your, your attention. Lorenzo wants to know how reliable Neuralusta 360 is with lower quality captured images. Um, I assume you're asking about um, lower resolution images, so um, larger steps between images if they're image stacks or um, uh, a, a lower power objective, say 10x instead of 40x. Uh, your mileage may vary. It depends on, on how complex the reconstruction is needed. Um, oh, there were a lot of questions about Golgi too. I I apologize. I've got to do a Golgi webinar, I think. So Golgi, we've made a lot of progress on that. Um, and I demonstrated all fluorescent images this time. Next time, I will do 2D and Golgi, I swear, um, as well as big data, because those are really exciting. Uh, Rafal has a question about how to reconstruct a series of axons traversing the lesion site in an injured spinal cord. For example, serotonergic axons, if their somas are not seen because they are far away, rostral to the lesion site. That's perfectly acceptable. All you need to do is just um, uh, trace the branches that you see. So trace those axons as they traverse, either automatically, interactively, or in combination with assisted manual. I think that would be... Um, uh, something that would be very applicable to Neuralusta 360. If you have image data, let's talk. Let's um, let's let's do a demo, and I can show you how it will work with your stuff. Okay. One one last question. I really appreciate it. Uh, well, two actually. Um, it's from a current Neuralusta user and wants to know how Neuralusta 360 recognizes branch order. So uh, in older versions of the software, when you're creating a reconstruction manually, as you get to a branch point, you right click and select what kind of node it is. So a bifurcation or a trifurcation. Uh, in Neuralusta 360, you no longer have to do that because the, the node, that connection point itself, just gets updated as you add more branches to it. So as you're tracing back and forth along the, the neuron, um, this position, as you add that branch to it, just gets added in. And so you no longer have to do that, that right click to say bifurcation, trifurcation, and make note of it. If you are tracing something really complex and you yourself want to keep track of that, you still have that ability. You can, in interactive mode, you can right here uncheck this box. If you do, then when you're placing endings or when you right click, you will have that option to select um, trees, uh, a branch point. So let me just demonstrate that real quick. So. I'm going to reconstruct this portion of the branch. And right here is a branch point. I'll right click. Oh. I'll right click and select um, uh, bifurcating, trifurcating node as, as desired, or just place an ending.
just like this. Okay. So would it be possible to combine the spine and synapse modules to look at what synaptic markers co-label with spines? Matthew, that's a really exciting question. Um, I, I think the answer is yes. And I think that that would be something that would be really cool to do. Um, so let's try it. And I think... I think that's where I'm going to stop for today. I really appreciate your attention, and um, I think uh, I hope I've been able to show off some of the really cool features of Neurolista 360. Please contact us, uh, come and talk to us, and get a free trial and uh, get this in your lab. Thanks again. Take care. <laughs>